Jim Siegler here, again, for another installment of the Brainwaves podcast. And the question I would like to pose to you this week is, can a neurologic disease enhance the function of the nervous system? For those of you who live under a rock, Phenomenon was a 1996 film starring John Travolta, Kira Sedgwick, Forrest Whitaker, and Robert Duvall. The movie was about a simple guy in small town USA who is transformed by this phenomenon, literally overnight. He's struck by a sensation of light and a boom, and later that night comes to certain realizations that he'd never reached before. He becomes hyper-intelligent, learning conversational Portuguese during a 25-minute car ride. George Mallory, you learned the Portuguese language in 20 minutes? He develops new solar technologies, He invents a fertilizer-based fuel product. And just for funsies, he cracks U.S. military codes. Is somebody trying to tell me something? Ah! What the hell? If there's ever a movie you want to watch that makes you feel unaccomplished, this is the movie you should watch. George, you have more area of active brain use than anybody ever tested. Ever. But John Travolta's new mental skill set extends beyond his capacity to learn and recall new memories. He develops extrasensory perceptions, such as the ability to feel ultra-low frequency tremors in the earth that predict an earthquake's coming. He could sense where an extremely sick boy was hiding in an orchard, and he even develops telekinesis. What you're about to see is not a trick, okay? It's just, um, well, let's call it an experiment in energy. You know, all this is is, a, is kind of a dance or a partnership between the energy coming from me and the uh, energy of the plastic. At the end of the movie, the viewer learns that all of John Travolta's talents and abilities are due to the consequence of a malignant brain tumor called an astrocytoma. George, George, there's a tumor in your brain that's spread out like a hand, threads it everywhere. But instead of dysfunction, now here's the mystery, George. Instead of destroying brain function, so far it's been stimulating it. We can't understand that. The very same tumor affecting John McCain and the former Senator Ted Kennedy. It's a bit of a stretch, and the concept that this tumor is enhancing the functionality of the brain is probably derived from this popular notion that humans only use a small portion of their brain, like 10%, which, by the way, is wholly untrue. We use all parts of our brain. Even more of a stretch is not that some of his brain is being enhanced, like the area responsible for memory, but that all of it's being enhanced by this tumor. Memory, sensation, attention, visuospatial organization, and then whatever part of the brain that's responsible for making things move when you're not touching them. This tumor is facilitating all of these functions. Knowing this, the question I want to answer today is, is this science or science fiction? We've got an amazing show for you today, and I'll be discussing examples from other organ systems about how diseases can facilitate function, and some that even improve survival. So stay with us. The Brainwaves Audio Podcast, LLC, is a flow-through entity, meaning that money flows through the paycheck of my regular day job and into the overhead costs for the podcast. There's really very little money in podcasting. And even though you're hearing ads by Audible, Blue Apron, Amazon, or NatureBox, they only make money for the podcast if you as the listeners purchase something from these companies through our links. So, if you want to support the show, check out these links, and see if there's anything that piques your interest. There might be something you like. As a medical student, I came across this book, Survival of the Sickest, by Sharon Molum which, by the way, is also available on Audible, and you can get it for free by signing up using the audibletrial.com slash brainwaves podcast link. Anyway, this book is about genetic mutations and infectious organisms that have survived over generations and generations because they provide us with some sort of survival advantage. In some unanticipated way, they enhance the function of an organ system or of the organism's body. And this isn't just true of humans. It's also observed in a number of other species. 
Let's take a certain breed of wood frogs, for example. In the winter, these small guys are at risk of freezing to death. But scientists have observed that hyperglycemia in these frogs is actually a protective mechanism. There are at least a few proven reasons to explain this. First, hyperglycemia is associated with dehydration. As you've seen in your patients with diabetes, they urinate a lot. The high serum glucose eventually enters their urine, creating an osmotic gradient that draws out more water, which ultimately dehydrates the body. This means less available water in tissues relative to the concentration of other solutes, such as glucose. And you may recall from elementary school that adding salt or sugar to water will lower the freezing point because solutes interfere with the crystallization of water molecules at lower temperatures. So when wood frogs have excess glucose in their blood relative to the water content, they're less likely to turn into a froggy icicle. Some experts believe that the same process explains why diabetes has also evolved in humans. It facilitates survival in colder climates. And sure, after 20 or 30 years of untreated diabetes, you get kidney problems and heart disease and you're at risk of strokes. But when the average life expectancy of early humanoids was just a few decades, the long-term risk was vastly outweighed by the early survival advantage of hyperglycemia in these colder climates. Let's move on to a more human-specific example. Many of you have probably heard why sickle cell anemia has persisted throughout human generations as a kind of fairly common disease, especially among African peoples. It's because sickle cell anemia reduces your risk of acquiring malaria, an extremely common mosquito-borne parasite endemic to many African countries. This is a classic teaching example of survival advantage in medical textbooks. But what you may not know is why would a disorder like hereditary hemochromatosis, a disorder characterized by abnormal iron metabolism, thrive among northern European peoples. An autosomal recessive condition with a high expressivity, hereditary hemochromatosis increases your risk of developing liver failure, liver cancer, diabetes, heart failure, and other complications that begin to manifest in early adulthood. So how have we not selected out patients with this disease who may be symptomatic by the time that they become reproductive? As it turns out, Hemochromatosis not only increases organ deposition of iron, but it sequesters iron from certain cells, notably macrophages. In certain populations, like those in northern Europe where tuberculosis is common, TB is more of a threat to life than genetic disorders, which could kill you over a matter of decades. In patients who have the gene mutation for hemochromatosis, whose macrophages are effectively starved of iron, mycobacterial species grow much more slowly and they proliferate less rapidly. This at least partially explains why the prevalence of hereditary hemochromatosis is greater among Europeans, because it's likely contributed to an increased survival in a population who's at higher risk of acquiring TB. So now we have two genetic diseases with relatively high prevalences that have not been selected out by evolution, because they conferred some sort of survival advantage. Type 1 diabetes, which affects one and a quarter million Americans, and hereditary hemochromatosis, which still also affects about a million Americans. To crudely summarize and extrapolate these data again, diabetes may reduce your risk of freezing in the cold of winter, and hemochromatosis may improve your odds of fighting off tuberculosis. But is there a condition out there which enhances human function, and not necessarily defends it against infectious organisms or an unsafe environment? In May 2017, I talked at length with Dr. Anjan Chatterjee about the benefits of neurostimulants like amphetamines and even caffeine on the nervous system, way back in episode 58 on cosmetic neurology. So I won't use that as an example here, but could there be anything else out there that might naturally influence cerebral function in a positive way? More specifically, can a brain tumor, like the one that John Travolta's character had, do this? This is a really tough question to answer, and it's more difficult than you'd think to just brainstorm diseases. So I approached the question in a couple of ways. First, I tried to imagine something that, at its biological basis, would be helpful to the person. Helpful neurologically. Like being able to see at a far distance, so you can spot that line in the savanna. But hyperopia and related neuropthalmic conditions aren't great examples for how a condition may improve the physiologic function of the brain. What about an enhanced fight-or-flight response? something where you have a hypervigilant sympathetic nervous system that keeps you at constant attention. 
A pheochromocytoma may possibly explain this, but it's not the best example since people with pheos also can experience a lot of fatigue rather than a continued state of alertness. And after a few more examples, I really couldn't find a good solution where a disease enhances a normal, favorable physiologic response. So I reasoned it out a second way, kind of opposite to the first. Instead of thinking about a condition that enhances a normal, favorable biologic function, what conditions could be associated with an impairment in normal, but unfavorable biologic function? Take pain, for example. Sure, you'd think it's evolutionarily helpful because it informs us to steer clear of sharp objects and to avoid being bitten by rattlesnakes in the wild. But even a moron knows to keep away from these things. So why have pain if you could just develop common sense? A congenital insensitivity to pain may be an elegant solution to this, and people who have this condition often have a mutation in a particular gene of sodium channels that are expressed in the dorsal root ganglia particularly in pain-sensing neurons, called the SCN9A gene. The most common variant of this class of diseases is HSAN1, or hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy, which is an autosomal dominant condition. And this is different from the ludicrous example of the James Bond villain from The World's Not Enough, who cannot feel pain because a bullet is lodged in his thalamus. Touch, smell, he feels no pain. He can push himself harder, longer, than any normal man. The bullet will kill him, but he'll grow stronger every day until the day he dies. Patients with SCN9A mutations, they really can't feel pain. And they also have a little bit of impairment in the ability to perceive pressure and vibration and position, but still these nerves are not perfectly functional. And often, patients with this class of disorders, they present early with recurrent painless bone fractures, ulcerations of the skin at the extremities, and they have severe joint injuries that only worsen with time. It turns out that we really do need our ability to sense pain. Next, I tried to imagine what conditions out there exist where a person could have an exceptional talent. What kind of a patient has a particularly unique ability? Thinking about this was a little bit easier, and two examples immediately came to mind the savant syndrome, and hyperthymesia. The savant syndrome is a neurologic condition that's characterized by an overall mental disability with what's described as an island of genius. Think of Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. How did you know my phone number? How did you know that? said read the telephone book last night. Dib Sally, 4610192. He uh, remembers things, little things sometimes. In that 1988 film, Dustin Hoffman's character, Raymond Babbitt, has an encyclopedic knowledge of all things music and literature, sports, zip codes, calendar dates, and so on. While this is a fictional example, it's based in part on prior reports of genius children who suffer from autism. It's thought that savants are actually quite common, with an incidence of 1 in 10 to 1 in 100 patients with autism. Almost always, these patients have an incomparable expertise in mathematics or memory, but their social skills and their capacity for functioning independently are typically very lacking. While having a powerful cognitive ability may make somebody more useful in a group environment, there doesn't seem to be an obvious evolutionary advantage, given the discounted skills in other critical domains that are responsible for survival. Hyperthymesia is the second example I'm thinking of. I hate to think of it as a disorder, it's more on the spectrum of having a photographic memory, otherwise known as an eidetic memory, just the really far, far end of that spectrum. The other term for hyperthymesia is highly superior autobiographical memory, or HSAM, which kind of nicely describes it for those of us who don't have a background in Greek. These patients are known for remembering everything that's happened to them. They can recall names, dates, events, hairstyles, shoe colors, and word-for-word -word conversations that they've had from years and years ago. There have only been a few dozen of these cases that are documented in the literature. Sounds kind of cool, right? But such a mental capacity is not without consequence. These patients are constantly remembering sequences of events, they're exhausted by the tirelessness of their memory recall, and it significantly interferes with their attention in the present moment. It's like constantly running on a treadmill. The treadmill just doesn't stop. 
And ironically, this biological blessing is also extremely limited. And perhaps this explains why hyperthymesia has not been selected for over the natural course of human evolution. Putting all of your neurologic energy into memory recall may not be evolutionarily advantageous. First of all, patients with hyperthymesia appear to have selective memories. If asked to remember a specific fact, like how many rugs has Paul Manafort been hoarding, they might have trouble recalling that number. But they may remember the exact patterns of the rugs, or what your hair looked like when you told them that fact, or the exact price of every rug that he's been hoarding. Using a more realistic real-world example from when humans were just learning to stand upright, hyperthymetics, if they had existed back in human history, they may have remembered how many fish you caught seven winters ago when food was scarce, but they may have difficulty remembering where that freshwater stream was or how to navigate back to it. And these patients may have other psychosocial comorbidities. One theory as to how these people developed such an impressive memory recall is that they're constantly retrieving this information and thereby living in the past. All those horrible events they've ever experienced arguments, breakups, broken bones, car accidents, horror movies, family deaths. They continue to re-experience them over and over and over, over and over, over and over and over. This formed the basis for the lack of forgiveness that was felt by one of House's patients back in season seven. Hyperthymesia, complete recall of every moment of every day since puberty. All seven million. In that show, the patient who was a waitress at a small time restaurant holds such a grudge for her sister that it actually makes her physically sicker. You can imagine that it's hard to forgive and forget if you can't even forget. I guess all things considered, there's not really a singular great example where a neurologic condition actually improves the central nervous system. Hyperthymesia is probably the best example. But there are definitely no reported cases of brain tumors or inflammatory diseases or strokes that can enhance brain function like Travolta's character experienced. Caffeine and neurostimulants, as we discussed before, these can enhance the physiologic function of the brain and maybe improve some performance, but only mildly. The pathophysiologic equivalents of caffeine and stimulants, like a pheochromocytoma, which is a very poor comparison, they're not great examples of any condition that could benefit the nervous system. Genetic mutations, such as those affecting SCN9A, which cause congenital insensitivity to pain, would be nice, did they not result in such profound bodily injury. And then there are some still multifactorial and unexplained conditions like the Savant Syndrome, where mental skills may be quite profound, but only at the cost of other cognitive functions. In all, some conditions may come close to John Travolta's situation and phenomenon, but maybe there is more fiction to that story than science. That's all I got for you this week on Brainwaves. Music was courtesy of Heisen, Arsenor, and Lee Rosevear. The producer and self-proclaimed movie aficionado would be myself, Jim Siegler. For more updates on the podcast and some interesting neurologic cases, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Stay tuned for some of our upcoming shows, including one on your funny bone and other causes of ulnar neuropathy, and later a case of altered mental status, bad blood, and severe kidney injury that's presented by Dr. John Paird from UCSF. Thanks for listening.